was a child in the internment camp of Slocan, there were no libraries. My dream of heaven was a library. I wanted it so much, and so of course I loved libraries. And libraries are incredibly important for people. I mean, this is where the wisdom of the world is. Way back in 1979, 1980, I was very poor. So I'd walk along, I'd find some paper in the garbage and take it to the library and work. I went to the reference library and I would go up to the top floor, the fifth floor, and into that wide open space, I would sit there and I wrote and rewrote the book, which turned out to be Obasan. The feeling I had when I was in that library, sitting at those big desks, all that space, and the light coming in, and being able to look out, I think it gave me an immense sense of freedom. Sometimes I would think, oh well, this place, the architect for it was Raymond Moriyama, who was in the camp with me in Slocan. So here we were, Japanese Canadians, here at the library. People who were in the internment camp of Slocan with me while I was writing about that. Writing about Slocan and the beet fields and the journey in Canada. It was so great to be there and to be free. So. That is what a library means for me, a place where there are books, where there is freedom, where you can travel without having to go somewhere else. A library expands you, it takes you away and into the places that matter. My name is Joy Kagawa, and I'm a writer. If it wasn't for the Toronto Public Library, I don't know how I would have stayed out of trouble in some pretty, key moments in my life. I grew up in a kind of neighborhood where a rambunctious young fellow like me could have got into a lot of trouble. My mother was raised by a single mom, was working a whole bunch of jobs and we couldn't afford a babysitter and uh, things were a little precarious. So what she would do in the morning was take me to the Albion Library in my neighborhood in Rexdale and she would bring me inside. She, I didn't know this till later, but would ask the librarians to make sure I didn't leave. And the librarians would with some regularity check in on me and hand me books and let me join book clubs and things like that and challenges to read this or read that. All the while just trying to keep me engaged and keep me in the doors. And then my mother, after finishing her shift at work, would come back. What was interesting about the public library is it wasn't just the books that got me. There's a whole section of records, right? And I was able to go in and listen to a lot of records that I wouldn't otherwise have had access to. And even more so, there was this black curtain over to the side, and I remember it really clearly because I used to see the adults walk behind that. And I was the sort of fella that didn't think there was a room that I couldn't go in, so I just followed. And I remember being five or six years old, sitting on these banquet chairs laid out with a white projection screen set up in a very temporary way. And I was watching Night of the Living Dead, <laughs> and that George Romero film was being screened at the library. And I watched it there, and that really sparked my interest in horror and the kinds of music I would listen to and the films that I wanted to make and the stories that I wanted to tell. So I was able to feed it at the library and I was able to expand it at the library. You need a place to go and you need a place to be with other people and you need a place to learn and you need a place that's free. If you grow up and you don't have any money, where are you going to go? The public library system for me in Toronto gave me access to a, a possible life that had music, that had books, that had politics, that had newspapers, that had history, that had everything I needed. It wasn't about what I couldn't have, it was quite the opposite. It was, here's what you could possibly have. That's a really important thing to teach a kid. If it wasn't for that library, I don't know what my mother would have done, where she would have dropped us off. Um, and could there even have been another place where you could put young, curious kids, where they could feed their curiosity and never get bored? I'm George Strombolopoulos and I am a broadcaster. Where well, I grew up in Scarborough, grew up in metro housing, so as many of us did. The first experience I guess I would have with the Toronto Public Library is not where one would traditionally expect it to be. It wasn't uh, in a physical place in terms of an edifice. It was actually with what they called the bookmobile. It would come right across the street from our neighborhood. All the kids from the apartments would come out, we'd cross the street. It parked in a local public high school and we would all board this bus that eventually almost became like it was a, uh, 
an ice cream truck. So it became a very intimate relationship, I suppose, because it's one where you felt like it came there just for you. It sort of gave us a value. It made us say to ourselves, you know what, we're worth something. We're worth them coming, staying for a few hours. Even if there's no one in the truck, they're still going to stay. So I may not have chosen books that were novels or, you know, these great big works of art, but I would take books that perhaps were picturesque, allowed me to leave the neighborhood for moments, allowed me to, to dream, to see continents I hadn't seen before, walk on the Sahara Desert. It gave me an opportunity to, to see things that I wouldn't have seen normally had it not been for the bookmobile there. When I think of the Toronto Public Library, I think of acceptance. It may seem like an interesting word, but it seemed to have accepted our community and reached out to it. So the first thing that I think of is the fact that it broke down some barriers of, of location. It allowed us to access something that we may not have accessed if it had not made itself available for us. It sort of begins the, uh, the legacy of learning. My name is Donald McLeod, and I'm a judge with the Ontario Court of Justice.